time now for the program, You and the God of Mercy, with Father Benedict Groeschel. And now, Father Groeschel. Hello, I'm Father Benedict Groeschel of the Franciscan Friars in the South Bronx, New York, and this is the third segment of our series on God's mercy in your life. And today we're going to talk about a modern revelation of God's mercy. It's probably wise to say a little bit about revelation. As you know, there is one public revelation, and that is in sacred scripture as it is interpreted not privately, but by the tradition of the church. And this is very, very important. That revelation closed at the end of the age of Jesus Christ. Didn't close with his death by any means, because we have several books of the Bible which are not about his life, but written quite some time after his death, called the Epistles and the book of Revelation, and the Acts. But when that whole event of the life of the Son of God and its effects, immediate effects, was over, sometimes called the Age of the Apostles, the public revelation came to an end. Uh, St. John of the Cross, the great mystic, writing about this, kind of paraphrases the words of God and he says, God says to us, I have given you everything. I have given you my son. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is nothing else for me to say. And St. John of the Cross is a great scholar and called the mystical doctor of the church. However, Christians have believed down through the centuries that at times God has inspired by his grace people in a variety of ways to restate, not to add to, the revelation of God. To take some part of the revelation and make it much more meaningful to a particular time. Uh, and this is done generally through rather holy people. And most religious denominations uh, w will speak one way or another about an inspired leader, an inspired teacher. Someone in whom the work of God and the grace of God is very obvious. And sometimes these people bring into focus a truth contained in the public revelation and they make it highlighted and meaningful to a particular time. In the Catholic tradition, these things are often called private revelations. They never contain anything that is new. They, uh, St. Paul says, even if an angel of God preaches another doctrine to you, don't accept it. So, we are not supposed to take something new. Somebody comes up with a new revelation of the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity or the relationship between creator and creature is different than it is presented in the Bible. We don't buy that, even if an angel brings it to us. But we do, at times, pay attention to important messages that are very specific given to particular people. Now, most Roman Catholics are deeply affected in their spirituality, in their climb toward God, their journey toward God, by a revelation that was given to a very humble, cloistered nun about 350 years ago, the revelation of the sacred heart of Jesus. And I'm sure many Protestant people going down the street and they see a big old Catholic church, and sacred heart church. Well, what, what, what is this? This nun, Margaret Mary Alacoque, was praying in the convent chapel, and it seemed to her that Jesus appeared to her 
and that she could see through the wall of the chest his heart burning with divine love for the human race. And he reiterated many of the teachings that he had given in the gospel, but applied them very directly to the times in which we live, calling people to have trust in his divine love, and especially calling to those who led sinful lives to trust in the love of God. And so Catholics, Catholics my age especially, when they think of our Lord Jesus Christ, often think of him with his heart visible. A heart is a symbol of divine love. No one could object to it. It doesn't in any way depart from anything in sacred scripture, but it depends on a revelation. Catholics are even more famous for their revelations, which we, have, we believe we have received from the mother of Jesus. The most famous of these is the revelation to the little peasant girl, Bernadette Subaru, in the village of Lourdes in the Pyrenees. A very simple message that the mystical figure spoke to her and said, tell the priests to build a church here and the people will come. And hundreds of millions of people have. And get the people to pray and to do penance, to pray for the salvation of the world. And this little girl gave the Catholics the devotion which they call Our Lady of Lourdes. The actual fact is that Bernadette did not know who she was speaking to. Um, and this has been made very popular by several films, especially one called The Song of Bernadette by the Jewish writer Franz Werfel, who had hidden at Lourdes during the Second World War. Now today I want to speak to you about something you've heard of on these programs before on EWTN, the private revelation to Sister Faustina Kowalska, a very, very humble, very simple Polish nun who died on the eve of the Second World War. Now it's important to know that when we think God has providentially and mysteriously revealed himself, it's important to know that the message is usually something that people aren't paying much attention to at a time. And that's why the private revelation is helpful. Uh, I'm writing a book right this minute on private revelations. Maybe in a while I'll be on here giving some rules and suggestions from the popes and from other spiritual writers how to deal with reports of private revelations. The basic rule is don't get carried away. For every three or four hundred private revelations that are reported, maybe one is taken seriously by the church. After Bernadette had her experience at Lord, no less than two hundred other apparitions were reported, which the church has never given any kind of credence to at all. The church also never requires anyone to accept a private revelation. You can be a good Catholic and reject them all. And the popes have said very specifically that we can't believe in a private revelation the same way that we believe in the truths of sacred scripture and tradition, which are the public revelation of God. So you can't have faith in a private revelation. The most you can do is you can say, well, I think, with the guidance of the church and what I've been able to read, that it probably happened that God providentially made something known to this person. Actually, it's very interesting. One of the people who received private revelations and acted on them changed the face of European history probably to this very day. If you pick up the newspaper sometime this week, there will be something about France and England, and it was certainly as a result of the revelation made to Joan of Arc that she changed the history of Europe and the map of Europe. France would be an English-speaking country right at this moment had it not been for this little peasant girl who received the revelations that she was to deliver France. Now, I want to say something about Poland 
where Sister Faustina lived before she had these revelations of God's mercy. And by the way, the picture on the wall there is a depiction of what Sister Faustina felt she had seen in the chapel. It, it's a picture showing our divine Savior with rays of light coming from his invisible heart. It's not that different, actually, from what St. Margaret Mary saw. And you'll notice that the rays are of two different colors, white and red, symbol sim symbolizing different theological aspects of divine mercy. Now, you don't have to accept divine mercy because of Sister Faustina. You have to accept divine mercy because of the whole Bible and our Lord Jesus Christ and St. Paul and the entire public revelation. But it is interesting that this poor girl, rather neglected and rejected by her family, a humble lay sister doing domestic tasks in the monastery, in the convent, who would die very young, was living through a merciless time. These revelations took place during the time of the rise of the Nazis, a rise of a political power that would put Poland in bondage for half a century, that would lead to the most distressing bloodletting and holocausts of Christians, Jews, and others, especially the terrible holocaust that was to take place on Polish soil at Auschwitz, with the Shoah, or the Jewish Holocaust. Poland at that time itself had a very dictatorial government. It was not a very merciful time. It was a cold, difficult time. And even, if I may say so, and I have many good friends who are Polish Catholics and Polish priests, they would have to tell you that Polish Catholicism was pretty rigid. It was tough. And it had a touch of what peasant Catholicism often does have, of fire and brimstone. And people were constantly being reminded of the justice of God, which was true of many societies and is true of many churches in the United States today. People are sternly reminded of the justice of God with just a little mention of God's mercy as we go by just to cover our tracks. And in the middle of all this, this nun, who knew no theology, simply had a devotional, direct approach to God. She believed that the Lord spoke to her. My good friend, Father George Kosicki, who you know from EWTN, has written an interesting book, Now is the Time for Mercy, about the revelations of Sister Faustina, uh, a book that's available from the Franciscan Unit University Press in Steubenville, Ohio. And Sister Faustina believed that she heard our Savior say this to her. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all the human race recognize my unfathomable mercy. Mercy that is so deep it cannot be measured. It is a sign for the end times, and after it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, let them have recourse to the font of my mercy. Let them profit by the blood and water which gust forth for them. And in the sign, in the painting, you see the white and the red rays of light symbolizing divine mercy. And they were tough times. Many people thought those times would be the end of the world. There is no doubt that prowling through the world at that time were at least two men who deserved the name Antichrist, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, capable of incredible cruelty, of the destruction of human life. It was a time of antichrists. It was like the end of the world. And on its eve, this little nun thought that Christ came to her. Now you must know about private revelations. 
that they are not infallible. They are not inerrant like sacred scripture. They're different. Part of the reason being is it's like any message given to a human being. They may get it wrong. They may misinterpret part of it. Pope Benedict XIV, writing about private revelations, says a private revelation given even to a canonized saint is subject to error. And there are examples of this. So, this is not another Bible. It's not another New Testament. It's not another official revelation. It's an interesting spiritual event that a very devout soul had, a soul who is now proposed to be considered to be called a saint of the church. And indeed, I don't think that it would be improper to say that the encyclical of the Pope on divine mercy was to some degree inspired by the experiences of Sesta Faustina, although, although no public teaching of the church is ever going to be based on a private revelation. It will always be based on scripture, tradition, and good theology. Now let me get off this rather abstract track and say that you and I know people who are frightening us. We're worried about their salvation. It may be your husband or wife, your son or daughter, your father or mother, someone who's alive, or perhaps someone who died in circumstances that are not at all encouraging. I become very impatient with those who are certain about who has been lost. Despite the teaching of our Lord, that we should judge not, lest we be judged ourselves. That we should not condemn. There are lots of people around right now who in the name of Christianity seem to be very eloquent in their condemnation. I do not think that this is wise, and I do not think that it is in keeping with the teaching of the New Testament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the very last moments of his life, reached out to a dying criminal and said to this man, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said that to a man who is called a criminal. The first witness of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is a woman, Mary of Magdala. And it is said of this woman that Christ cast seven devils out of her. I'm a psychologist. I don't know what seven devils means, but it's not a very positive diagnosis. I got news for you. And she was the first witness to the resurrection. Some people claim that she was the first witness because once she was converted, she went to everything. So she never missed anything. And if you go to everything, you'll be there for the resurrection. Now, I worry about people. People that die who seem to be unrepentant. I think of a friend of mine named Ed. He had once been horribly, horribly anti-Catholic. He told me he used to read the obituaries to see if there were Irish or Italian names because it made him feel happy that some Catholics were dead. But finally he joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and got his life together, although he was never a full-fledged AA member because he was an atheist. He could not come to a belief in God. And he talked to me about it. He, he wanted to believe, and he could not. And one day, he fell off the wagon. After years of sobriety, he drank one weekend, and it shattered him, and he continued to drink. And I stood by his bedside with two devout Catholic men who were members of AA, really prayerful men, and Ed was throwing up his life. He was regurgitating pure blood. His liver was gone. And we prayed and prayed. And I finally had to leave to go teach in the seminary. When I got back, Ed was dead. And I worried about that all these years. And in the writings of Sister Faustina, I found this little revelation that this holy nun felt that the Lord had revealed to her. See if you can picture the scene. The little chapel in Poland before the war. 
the Master, mysteriously speaking. And he gives her this revelation where he says to the, those who appear to be lost, O soul steeped in darkness, do not despair. All is not lost. Come and confide in your God, who is love and mercy. But the soul, deaf even to this appeal, wraps itself in darkness. Jesus calls again, my child, listen to the voice of your merciful father. And the soul replies, for me there is no mercy. And it falls into even greater darkness, a despair, which is a foretaste of hell. And Jesus calls a third time, but the soul remains deaf, blind, hardened, and despairing. And then the mercy of God begins to exert itself. And without any cooperation of the soul, God grants it final grace. If this too is rejected, God will see, leave the soul in this self-chosen disposition for eternity. But this grace emerges from the merciful heart of Jesus and gives the soul a special light by means of which the soul begins to understand God's effort. Conversion depends on its own will. The soul knows this. For her, it is a final grace. And should it show even a flicker of goodwill, the mercy of God will accomplish the rest. You know, I believe that. I don't believe it because it is so eloquently presented by the little humble nun in her religious experience. I believe it because it is totally consistent with the New Testament. That the Master comes and seeks out those who are lost. Brothers and sisters, I have a man about whose salvation I am in fear and trembling. A man who has so much to answer for because he has been given so much. And that's me. I've gone to Mass and Communion almost every day since I was 14 years old. I've lived in the house of God. And from those to whom much is given, much will be expected. I trust in the mercy of God for the poor sinner that even seems to human beings to have rejected God, to lapse into unconsciousness. And God's grace is working there because I believe that God's grace is working for me. I believe in the mercy of God for others because I believe in the mercy of God for my own poor self. And that gives me great hope in these dark times for the world in which we live. Thank you.